So this is uh, Sasha Hart. Uh, make Pi Pi fast. Yes, make my, make a Pi Pi fast. Make Pi Pi fast. All right. Or how to make your own Pi Pi in five minutes. It's much simpler than you think. A Pi Pi can actually be any static HTTP server. You just have to tell pip where to go. Any stupid script, including one you write, can assemble the files for you. Several are publicly available. There's a nice package called pip 2 pi It doesn't matter. First thing you would do is you could assemble the files. So you see I'm installing pip 2 pi and I'm running it, and I'm installing one of my favorite packages, which I wrote. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not installing it. I'm just putting it into a directory that's called uh, PyPI. Then if I want to copy the files, I'm going to copy them to a place where I'm, that I'm going to serve them from shortly. Kind of obvious. Then I'm just using Nginx because I like Nginx. doesn't matter. You can install Nginx. Here's a sam sample Nginx config that you could write. I put it in sites available. doesn't really matter. You see it just listens on port 80, and it serves out of the directory we put the files in. Then we want to enable it. We have to. We can do a symlink, whatever. This is just Debian stuff. You could do it sim more simply, and reload the config to make sure that it takes effect. Then you can actually try it with pip. Here I'm manually specifying index URL to point to my localhost server that I'm running. Works like PyPI, just fine. If if I like the result of doing something like that, and I have tons of packages cached in my PyPI or whatever, I can actually edit my pip.conf and point repoint it. At my local, I'm sorry, the 8080s are on, I'll fix it later. The end. <laughs> All right, now. Okay, I actually already inflicted this on people who came to one of my earlier talks, so I'll make it fast in case this is painful. So the basic premise here is I want you to like find a really good editor and use it rather than struggling with crappy ones in silence. Why bother? Less fighting with a stupid editor means less frustration, more time for what you actually mean to be doing, right? Like you don't want to be fighting with things like tab characters. Basic dilemma though that everyone has is you use these weak editors and they suck and you actually after a while realize they suck but switching it takes time. So you're just like let me get this one thing done and then I'll fix it some other time but actually six months later you're still struggling with freaking tabs. Solution that I propose is that you just bite the bullet, choose a really good editor that like other people use, take some time to get used to it, learn it well, you get the benefits of a strong editor ever after, you never have to switch again. I'm going to tell you that the difference between having a crappy editor and having a good editor is like the difference between having hot showers and having no showers, okay? <laughs> like, it's, it's a really nice feeling. I'm not saying it's gonna make you super fast at programming and better and whatever. There's like really good professionals who use terrible tools, but they're not enjoying the hot shower. What makes an editor good? Well, I'd say the bare minimum is that it does, works in the places you need to use it. Works on the platforms you wanna use, helps you with the languages that you wanna use, customizable to preferences and unforeseen needs that you will have, and importantly, does not eat your text for no reason, okay? A lot of, there are a lot of editors that are not writing your stuff to disk on a regular basis. And if you wanna write Python, I think it's kind of important to have proper soft tabs and the ability to show white space. What are signs of maturity for an editor? It's been around for a while, has a lot of users, it's still maintained, periodic releases, and it's either open source or made by a stable and reputable company. Signs of power. You can actually modify your key bindings if you need to. You have Searcher in place that does have support for regular expressions or something of similar power. There's some ancient 70s IBM text editors which have non-regex engines, never mind that. Um, it's really, really helpful if users can easily add support for new languages, newest version of JavaScript, whatever. And uh, I think this is important, but not everyone will. There's a scripting language available inside the editor, but you can choose. How can you find your editor? Let me help. I can't choose it for you, but I spent a really long time building a database of uh, most of the existing text editors out there, and I made a website of them to help you narrow it down. And that's the URL, Python editors. Thanks. Okay, and next up we have Jeff Rush, and he's gonna be uh, talking about ways to call out. It's up okay. now. Okay, this actually is a, uh, a talk of seven lightning talks that I was challenged to create one time. So I will not do all seven, no, this is just one. Uh, ways to call out is about, uh, it's a beginner's kind of a talk. The idea is that there's times when you want to, uh, a, a class relationships. So you may say at the top, top here, a building, you may have a, a library situation that provides a set of functions that you wish to call. Uh, and at, uh, say you have an authorizes function there. And you have down below it a subclass of that 
where you want to, uh, it's been called to grant some permission to something, the person, and it wants to call back up to the parent class. So it uses the parent class as a uh, dashboard or a library of uh, useful things to call. So we often, we often think of that as the parent class gets called a lot. The second coding scenario is where the top class may be, say, a framework, where the framework captures a complex algorithm, but you would like to, at certain points of that algorithm, inject your code into it. It's still a parent-child relationship, as you see, but the difference is that the parent is calling down to the child in order to uh, in, uh, invoke the specialized logic in the middle of its algorithms. So it's, 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 to experienced developers, it's not much, but to beginners, it's, it's a useful uh, uh, concept there. Uh, the only other part I got here is calling with computed arguments, which is sometimes useful but confusing to beginners, which is where you may have at the top here under the draw floor plan, you have uh, positional arguments and you have keyword arguments that you can create as, a, you know, as a keywords as a dictionary. And then you can conditionally add new arguments constructing your argument string dynamically at runtime. Uh, including both the adding positional arguments or adding uh, keyword arguments. And then at the bottom, it simply shows to uh, how, how you would invoke those. Again, very simple, but, uh, but beginners aren't sure how to do that. Okay, that's the end of one of the talks. Okay, you got three minutes left? Three minutes. You want to keep going? I'll keep going. Okay. It's like the game show. <laughs> I'll take door number three and I'll keep playing. No. Uh, uh, this is about the weak reference module. It's in, it's in the standard library. Uh, say you have a case here where you have a class of members and you want to keep a record of all the instances of this class that have ever been created. Your first approach, you would make the roster a set, and your init, you would simply register the instance with that set, and you maybe subclass it with a parent. Uh, so down to the bottom, you create two of the vendors, you, uh, you check that roster, see if they're in there, yes, they're in there. Uh, you then come along and you delete one of those vendors, but you find that your roster still has two entries because although you deleted one of the object references, the other object, uh, the reference is still there and the object stays around. How do we fix that? So we go on to the weak reference module up here, and uh, we add, instead of adding the, uh, a, a direct reference to the object and the set ro a self roster add, we add a weak reference to it. We create the same scenario, we delete it. The reference is still in the roster, but it's been tagged as a dead reference. So, uh, so it, that's, that's better, okay? Uh, and we can also uh, uh, programmatically walk through that roster and we can test it and say, are you dead, are you dead, are you dead? And we could then skip over them when we're printing them or maybe you know, manually delete them. But we can do better. So we can extend it to where we, we want to be notified when the, when the reference becomes dead. So we add, when we add, add the, uh, to the roster, we uh, create the weak reference with a uh, reference to a function called is dying. It has to be a class method, just the nature of uh, the way it is, because the instance may be going away at the time. And so the is dying then down below has the roster remove and removes the weak reference. Now when we delete it, it actually only shows the living references, not the dead references. So, okay. Thank you very much. And finally, we have James Powell, and he is going to uh, give a lightning talk entitled Newton's Method. And that concludes PyTexas 2014. So uh, unless Glenn has something final to say on behalf of the organizing committee, thank you for uh, coming to Texas A&M and College Station, and thank you for making uh, Pi Texas 2014 a very successful event. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thanks to the sponsors again for Pi, uh, bringing Pi Texas and making it available, and thank you to the volunteers, and a very huge thank you to all of the committee members, and thank you to Carl for recording all the video, um, and so that it can be online and we can see Pi Texas all over again whenever we want to. All right, thank see you guys you. next year, and safe travels. And finally, we have James Powell, and he is going to uh, give a lightning talk entitled Newton's Method. Oops.